Many people are coming out and saying that dispensationalism can't be found in the Bible, and that is just a doctrine of a devil, and that they want to dispense with dispensationalism. They claim that if a man picked up the Bible and read it, that he wouldn't even find dispensationalism in the Bible. They make claims that you are just following a man instead of the Holy Spirit. They make the claim that since God doesn't change, as the Bible says, and since Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that this means he deals with man the same throughout the entire Bible. But Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says this, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, the men who are against dispensationalism will go to the Schofield Reference Bible and see how Schofield taught dispensationalism, which isn't exactly right because uh, Schofield looks at it as a period of time. But dispensation is God dispensing something. So the best way to look at the Bible is through the covenants. Men who are against dispensationalism will go to the Old Testament and say, Everyone was saved by looking forward to the cross, but verses like 1 Peter 1-10 through 10 shows us that this can't be true. Look at 1 Peter 1, 10-12, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us that did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Notice the verse said it wasn't revealed to them, but to us that did minister the things. Also the disciples didn't even understand the death, burial, and resurrection, even though they walked and talked with Jesus Christ. The disciples were clueless about the gospel that Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. For example, Peter rebukes the Lord Jesus Christ when he says he is going to be killed in Mark 8, 31-33. If Peter knew that Jesus Christ had to die for his sins, then why was he going to try and stop Jesus Christ from dying for the sins of the whole world? In John 18, 8 through 10, Peter tries to stop the soldiers from taking Jesus and cuts off the ear of Malchus. If he understood the death, burial, and resurrection, then why was he trying to stop the very thing that would save his soul from hell? In Luke 24, 10 through 11, when the women told the apostles about the Lord Jesus Christ resurrecting, the Bible says it seemed to the apostles as idle tales. That's strange if they understood the death, burial, and resurrection. Why would it seem to them as idle tales? In Luke 24, 12, when Peter looked in the sepulcher and seen Jesus' clothes, but yet no Jesus, it talks about him wondering what had come to pass. That's strange if he understood the death, burial, and resurrection like me and you understand it. After Jesus' resurrection in Luke 24, 25 through 27, he was having to explain to the disciples the scriptures concerning himself. You know why? Because it wasn't revealed to them. Me and you can pick up the Old Testament and see all the prophecies of Jesus Christ because it is revealed to us. But like it said in 1 Peter, it wasn't revealed to the Old Testament prophets. They wrote that stuff down, but they didn't really understand what God was saying concerning the prophecies of Jesus Christ. The gospel that me and you know today was hid from the disciples because they didn't have it revealed to them. Were the disciples lost? No, they just weren't saved like me and you were saved. If Peter didn't understand the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection, then was he lost? Well, if he, he was lost, if you don't make any divisions in your Bible. Because 2 Corinthians 4.3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Simon Peter wasn't lost, he just wasn't saved like me and you were saved. In Luke 18, 34, after Jesus told the disciples about the death, burial, and resurrection, it said the disciples understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. And you're going to sit there and tell me that they were saved just like me and you were saved, and totally mess up your Bible and make it contradict 
and make God a liar? These guys who get up and scream and holler claiming dispensationalists are teaching doctrines of devils and following men are really just the ones following men theirself. It seems as if they are the ones following Baptist tradition. You can scream something for hours and hours, but the loudness of your voice doesn't make your lies any more true. I'm not against preachers that yell. I mean, I like it, but a lot of times these guys will get up and yell and make jokes to cover up the false doctrines that they're teaching. They have to yell to put some authority behind what they're saying because the book is the final authority and it's not backing up what they're saying. But on the other hand, there are tons of Bible preachers who believe people were saved by looking forward to the cross, and I believe they are sincere and honestly believe this to be so. And this isn't something I would break fellowship over or be mean to somebody over. But reading the Bible and seeing clear verses, I can't say with an honest heart that they are right. I'd rather take the Bible position than go along with the majority of people. The Old Testament saints did it make it to heaven other than by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ but you're forgetting that in the Old Testament they didn't go to the third heaven they went to paradise or Abraham's bosom in the heart of the earth and if you hate dispensations then you will end up getting rid of paradise and say everyone always went to heaven when they died you know why they do this because they know if they were saved the same way then why didn't they go to the same place when they died as we do if Lazarus was saved just like me and you, then why didn't he go to heaven when he died? He went to paradise, which was in the heart of the earth, or Abraham's bosom. And they end up getting rid of paradise, and this leads them to eventually say Jesus Christ burned in hell when he was in the heart of the earth. They also claim that the more well-known dispensational teachers like Sam Gipp, Peter Ruckman, and others didn't believe in grace in the Old Testament which is slander, because they both teach there was grace in the Old Testament. Without grace, how could anyone be saved? Just because you're saved by grace doesn't mean you're saved by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. They also slander dispensationalists and claim that we don't believe in the omniscience of God and pull out verses like Revelations 13, 8, which talk about Jesus being slain from the foundation of the world. They say if God knew Jesus Christ was going to die, then why did he mess around with any dispensations or covenants? Jesus Christ has always been here. He has no beginning. But in the Old Testament, he hadn't come down to the earth in the flesh to die for our sins yet. Of course God knew Jesus Christ was going to die for our sins and there was no other way to permanently cleanse men of sin but to say since God knew the future and knew how we, we would be saved in this age to say that that means all the Old Testament saints were saved by looking forward to the cross is confusing the omniscience of God with the appropriation of the sacrifice to the sinner. Just because he knew Jesus Christ was going to die and shed his blood doesn't mean he would apply the blood of Jesus Christ to sinners in the Old Testament. God knows everything. Nothing takes him by surprise. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? He knew everything that was going to happen and no Bible believer in their right mind would deny the omniscience of God. This is a lie from non-dispensationalists to say that Dispensationalists do not believe in the omniscience of God. Also, just because God knows something is going to go badly doesn't mean he won't go through with doing it anyway. For example, God knew Adam and Eve was going to eat off the tree, but he still made them and still made the tree and still gave them the option to eat or not eat off of it. He knew they were hiding, but he still asked them where they were. He knew how they found out they were naked, but he still said, Who told you that you were naked? He knew where Abel was after Cain killed him, but he still asked, Where is Abel thy brother? He knew, he knew man was going to fail from the get-go under each covenant, and that Jesus Christ was going to die for our sins, but he still dealt with man differently. That is just the way God is. This is plain, simple stuff you get just from reading the Bible. No college education is needed. Nothing about this is complicated. 
All you need is a heart that will believe what you read and willingness to sit down and read it and study it. Non-dispensationalists talk about how dispensationalism is complicated. But you just have to study, as it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, and not adopt the phrase, people were saved by looking forward to the cross. It seems like they adopt that phrase to get out of studying this stuff because they think it's complicated, and it's not. The Old Testament saints didn't understand a lot of the things we do now. These mysteries weren't revealed until Paul came along and he revealed them to us, as the Bible talks about in Ephesians 3, 5 through 7. God had some things hidden to people back then that are now revealed through Paul. The principalities and powers probably didn't even realize what the crucifixion was all about. That's why in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, says which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the lord of glory so the old testament saints didn't have the gospel revealed to them they didn't go to the same place when they died as we do they didn't have the sealing of the holy spirit like we do now david prayed for the holy spirit not to be taken from him samson lost the holy spirit and it came back and saul had it and then eventually lost it for good they also didn't have the spiritual circumcision the circumcision made without hands where God performs an operation and cuts your soul loose from your flesh. Unlike us, the Old Testament saints had sins applied to their souls. As the Bible talks about in Leviticus 17.11, if you're saved and you sin today, those sins aren't applied to your soul because you have the spiritual circumcision. And there are tons of differences and things that are different are not the same. With this in mind, let's look at how God dealt with men in the past and how he deals with them now and how he will deal with them in the future. First, we'll see how God dealt with Adam and Eve before the fall. And this is known as the Edenic Covenant. During this time, Adam was told to replenish the earth and have dominion over all the animals. And he was to eat herbs and fruits. Adam was put into the garden and he was to dress it and to keep it. And most Bible teachers and even most people who claim to be dispensationalists don't realize that in the Edenic Covenant, the plan of salvation was purely works. Adam and Eve were innocent, and that is why many refer to this as the dispensation of innocence. They weren't to look forward to the cross for eternal life. They had eternal life as long as they didn't eat off of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you look at Genesis 2.16, it says, And the Lord God commanded... The man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. There wasn't a Mosaic covenant to keep or to violate because Moses hasn't, hadn't even been born yet. And Romans 3.20 says, By the law is the knowledge of sin. But if they add off the tree, they would surely die. This is referring to a spiritual death as well as a physical death because Adam and Eve died spiritually when they ate the fruit but didn't die physically until hundreds of years later. They were not saved like we are in the church age because they were saved by not doing something. The thing they were to abstain from doing was eating off of a tree. Abstaining from doing something would be a work. There was no faith involved. It was purely works. God was right there talking with Adam. So where would faith come into play? And there wasn't any sacrificing of animals for anyone to say they were looking forward to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So if Adam were to give out tracts, they would have said, Don't eat off the tree. If you do, thou shalt surely die. God knew that if they truly loved him, then they would make the right choice by their own free will and keep this one command. He didn't want robots that were programmed to do exactly what he wanted against their own will because that just isn't love. Adam and Eve did eat off the tree and Genesis 3-7 says, And the eyes of them both were opened, so they were innocent of the knowledge of good and evil, but they disobeyed God and ate off the tree. Overlapping through the rest of the Bible is the commission to replenish. This even goes out into eternity where sinless bodies that aren't glorified bodies must eat off of a tree of life. These sinless people will keep increasing the population of the kingdom. This is why the Bible says his kingdom won't have an end. If you look at Revelation 22:14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, 
that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's not for us because we're not getting life off of a tree. Uh, Luke one thirty three says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that's because these people who are sinless but won't have glorified bodies will pop, keep populating his kingdom throughout eternity. Isaiah 9 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth e even forever. Now we're going to see how God dealt with Adam and Eve after the fall. This is known as the Adamic covenant. Since Adam and Eve disobeyed and ate off the tree, the Bible says in Genesis 3, 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. The Bible says here they knew that they were naked. They were no longer innocent, and were then conscious, conscious of their sin. That is why a lot of people call this the dispensation of conscience. The Bible shows God required a blood sacrifice in this age because Genesis 3.21 says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And Adam and Eve trained up Abel in the way he should go, and, all, and he offered the right offering to God, as it says in Genesis 4.4. 4. But his brother Cain didn't bring the prof, proper offering, as it says in Genesis 4.3. So God didn't accept the offering of Cain. In Genesis 4, 5, it says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had, no, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. He accepted Abel's blood sacrifice and rejected Cain's offering of works. This shows that in, the, in this covenant they were saved by faith in the bloody animal sacrifice without works. There is nothing that would lead us to believe they were saved by looking forward to the cross. The only thing similar is that they were saved by faith and a blood sacrifice like we are. And their blood sacrifice was a type of the ultimate sacrifice to come. But they didn't have that revealed to them. They didn't have a Bible and the Mosaic Law hadn't even been written. So they had to go by their conscience. They had to stay away from what they knew to be wrong and do what they knew to be right. Genesis 4, 7 if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Even under the Mosaic Law, the Gentiles operate under this same conscious system. So during that time, you have two dispensations working at the same time, overlapping each other. This is because the Gentiles only had the law written in their hearts, as it talk, talks about in Romans 2.15. The same is true for the time of Jacob's troubled time period where you have the gospel of the kingdom for the Jews and the everlasting gospel for the Gentiles. Jesus also stepped out of his dispensation to Israel and dealt with a Gentile in Matthew 15, 22 through 28. He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel but crossed his dispensational boundaries and made the Gentile woman's daughter whole. Some consequences to Adam and Eve's sin was that they could no longer enter into the Garden of Eden, Eden or eat off the Tree of Life because they would live forever in their sinful state. And now Eve has to have painful childbirth and be under the rule of her husband. And this doesn't stop after this covenant. It goes clear through the church age. And this is why it's better to look at the Bible through covenants because these covenants overlap each other. Instead of looking at it through uh, dispensations that stop with certain periods of time these things overlap each other in Genesis 3 16 it says unto the woman he said I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee and Adam had to start farming to get his food by the sweat of his face and the ground was cursed because of what they did and it's still cursed today and you can read about this in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. If men were to pass out tracts in that age, they would not read, look forward to the cross. It would read, put your faith in a bloody animal sacrifice and don't bring your fruit of the ground because it is not of works. 
So they were saved by grace through faith and a bloody animal sacrifice. That is how God shed his mercy on them was through that means. And everyone in the Old Testament eventually got to heaven only by the blood of Jesus Christ. But what got them to paradise in the heart of the earth had nothing to do with looking forward to the cross. It was doing what God said when he said it. God doesn't deal with everyone the same throughout the Bible as we talked about earlier. And as it talks about in Hebrews 1 and verse 1. But now we're going to look at how God dealt with Noah. This is still under the Adamic covenant and under the dispensation of conscience. In Genesis 6, 5 it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every ma imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Lucky for the human race, God found one righteous man named Noah. He did what Genesis 4, 7 said. He did what he knew to be right and refrained from doing what he knew was wrong. Because of this fact, God imparted righteousness to Noah. In Genesis 7, 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come now, and all thy house unto, thy, unto the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. But unlike salvation in the church age, Noah's righteousness was his own righteousness. If you look at Ezekiel 14, 14, it says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. In the church age, there is none righteous, no, not one, and we don't go about to establish our own righteousness. Romans 3.10 says, that is, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 10.3, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you can see we don't have any righteousness worth anything. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis 6, 8. But just because he found grace doesn't mean he was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Noah had faith in what God said about the coming flood and he had enough faith to build the ark. Many will go to he Hebrews 11 to prove Noah was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But notice his faith is for something physical. Let's read the verse real quick in Hebrews 11:7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah was saved by grace through faith, but he also had to be obedient and do the work that God told him to do, which was getting on the ark he was commanded to build in Genesis 6.14. And Noah and his family had to enter into the ark. While he had to have obedience in works, we have to have obedience of faith, as it talks about in Romans 16, 26. And Genesis 6, 18 says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. Genesis 7, 7, And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood. So grace was involved. Grace is always involved in salvation. Faith was involved. If Noah didn't have faith, then he wouldn't have built the ark. He didn't have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't even know who Jesus Christ was. Noah was obedient to the truth that was dispensed to him. For this reason, when he died, he went to paradise in the heart of the earth. After Jesus Christ died on the cross, his sins were cleared and he could then go to the third heaven. So eventually he was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but he never would have got the opportunity if he hadn't even, if he hadn't been obedient to the truth God dispensed to him. If he didn't have faith to build the ark, he would have died and went to hell with the rest of the people who were called ungodly. The ark is a type of Jesus Christ because the ark only had one door, as it says in Genesis 6, 16. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is only one door to get into heaven. Noah did not have this revealed to him, so he wasn't saved by looking forward to the cross. Noah was saved by building a boat and getting in the boat. Genesis 6.22 Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And God gives mercy to those who obey what he tells them to do throughout the Bible. If you read Psalms 103, 17, and 18, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children, 
to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Noah was righteous because he did what God said. Him building the ark and boarding, boarding the ark didn't just lead to his physical salvation but also spiritual salvation. You can see this because God calls Noah righteous in Genesis 7 1 when he is getting on the ark. And God calls people who didn't get on the ark ungodly in 2 Peter 2 5. The Old Testament put the emphasis on the visible, physical, outward salvation, unlike how the New Testament starts with the heart and focuses on the spiritual salvation. Noah did what God said, and then in the New Testament, God calls Noah a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2 5. Noah had 120 years to preach of the coming flood, and his street preaching signs wouldn't have said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And his tracks wouldn't have said, Look forward to the cross of Calvary. They would have said, A flood is coming. Do what thou knowest is right. And when the flood comes, don't miss the boat. But everyone missed the boat besides Noah and his family because they didn't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. Since Noah preached righteousness, all of the people who died in the flood were without excuse. Men are always without excuse for not doing what God said. After getting off the ark in Genesis 8.20, Noah offers an animal sacrifice to the Lord. This points to Jesus Christ who would be the ultimate sacrifice. But Noah didn't even know who Jesus Christ was or about the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. So he couldn't have been saved just like we are in the New Testament. And if that is not good Baptist doctrine, then so be it. But the Bible doesn't teach we are all saved the same way. Genesis 8.20, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now looking at the Noahic covenant, we can see some things in this covenant that overlap to today. Genesis 9.3 shows man can now eat animals, whereas before they ate herbs and fruits, we are still allowed to eat animals up until the millennium, where it goes back to how it was before. Genesis 9.3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Then in Genesis 5.6, you see the death penalty is instituted, and this goes on up until there is no more sin or death. This shows that not everything in the Old Testament was just for that time. There are things in the Old Testament that still apply to us today. Now we're going to look at how God dealt with Abraham. Under this covenant, God calls out Abraham and promises to either bless or curse the world through him and his descendants. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The Bible makes it clear that this is an everlasting covenant. There was a work men had to do, and that they had to bless Abraham. If they didn't, they would be cursed. This everlasting covenant lasts forever. Are you going to make God a liar and say that he broke this covenant? In Judges 2, 1, it says, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers and I said I will never break my covenant with you Genesis 17 7 through 8 and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession I will be their God this covenant relates to a physical piece of land and is to physical Jews only in the sense of the land. But there is also a spiritual seed of Abraham. If you are born again, you are a spiritual seed of Abraham. But the physical Jews get the physical piece of land and they get it forever. As it says in Genesis 13, 14 through 15, And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where art. Where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. The millennium 
will satisfy God's promise to Abraham in full. God gives Abraham the sign of circumcision as an outward sign of this covenant in Genesis seventeen eleven, And this brings a new race and is also a type of the spiritual circumcision that we get when we are born again in Colossians 2, 11. Paul talks about Abraham in Romans 4, 3 and says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Many will use this verse to say he was saved by looking forward to the cross by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what Abraham believed that got him imputed righteousness wasn't the death, burial, and resurrection. He believed God about his seed. We aren't going to add to the words. We are going to simply read what it says in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. We get accused of adding these doctrines to teach dispensationalism. But really, you would have to add the phrase, Abraham believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, to teach what they are putting out there. Let's look back in the Old Testament and see what Romans 4, 3 is referring to. In Genesis 15, 5 through 6, it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham got imputed righteousness here for believing God about his seed being as the stars. He didn't get justified until he offered Isaac in Genesis 22. James 2.21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled? which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. He got imputed righteousness by believing what God said about his seed and then got justified later by offering Isaac upon the altar. Showing a difference between Abraham's salvation and church age salvation. In this age we are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and we get imputed righteousness and justification at the same time. Genesis 22, 5 says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. By Abraham saying, Come again to you, this shows he believed in a resurrection of a dead son. He believed Isaac would be resurrected, and this is why Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day in John 8, 56. Abraham didn't look forward to the cross and see Jesus Christ. He just believed in a resurrection of a dead son. So Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Even if Abraham did see Jesus Christ and look forward to the cross, in Genesis 22, he got righteousness seven chapters earlier when he believed God about his seed, showing a difference between his salvation and New Testament salvation. So Abraham was saved by faith in something, but that something wasn't what we place our faith in to be saved. So there is a difference there. The faith we have is complete because it is based on the completed work of Christ. Abraham had faith, but his faith wasn't perfect. It needed perfecting, and it wasn't perfected until he showed his faith by his work when he offered up Isaac. And that's why it says in James 2.23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. It was fulfilled when he offered Isaac on the altar. Now we're going to see how God dealt with people under the law. In this covenant, the people of Israel had to do certain works. The Mosaic law was Jewish in nature, and during this time the Gentiles followed their conscience, as I said before. The Mosaic Law built upon the foundation of the Abrahamic Covenant regarding the promises to enter in their land. But the promises in Deuteronomy were conditional on obedience. And the promises to Abraham were unconditional. And that's the difference. The Old Testament Jew had to make sure his standing was forgiven by being righteous and obedient to the law. He had to do the things that were prescribed in the law each time he sinned. Many anti-dispensational teachers will accuse us of believing these people kept the law perfectly, which they certainly didn't. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, Solomon says there is not a just man upon the earth, but in Ecclesiastes 8.14, he talks about righteous men. So, these people could have been righteous without being sinless. 
righteousness was dispensed by faith and works under the Mosaic Covenant. When the children of Israel broke one of the commandments, he would take the sacrifice down to the tabernacle. Leviticus 1.4 says, And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. Atonement broken down is at one -ment. This is how they were made at one with God. This offering got them temporary forgiveness until they sinned again, and then they would have to offer another one. None of these sacrifices were permanent, and it didn't clear them even though they received forgiveness. Uh, Exodus 34, 6 says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation and hebrews 10 4 for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins so under the old testament they were forgiven and became at one with god but they had to keep the commandments to obtain this and when they did break one of god's commands they had to sacrifice an animal deuteronomy 11 1 Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and comm his commandments always. Under the Mosaic Covenant, they had to keep his charge, statutes, comm statutes, judgments, and commandments. Under the law, you had to do something to be blessed, and if you stopped doing them, you would be cursed. Deuteronomy 6.25, And it shall be our righteousness. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Notice it said it would be our righteousness. This shows a difference between Old Testament and New Testament salvation because in the church age, our righteousness is no good. We need Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness because there is none righteous, no, not one. And we shouldn't be ignorant of God's righteousness and go about to establish our own righteousness. Righteousness no longer comes by the law. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. For example, under the law, the children of Israel had to keep the Sabbath or they would be put to death. It was a sign between God and the nation of Israel. And you can see that in Exodus 31, 13 through 14. But in the church age, we're not under the law, so we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Colossians 2, 16 says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. In terms of salvation, the law is done away with in the New Testament. In Galatians 3.11, Paul says, No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Paul goes as far as saying, If any man tries to just, justify himself by the law in the church age, that they are fallen from grace. This isn't meaning they lost their salvation, because if they tried to justify themselves by the works of the law, and depended, depended on that without placing their faith in Christ, then that is the road to hell. The only way to make it to heaven is by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not trying to keep the law. In Romans 2.13, Paul is dealing with salvation under the Mosaic Covenant, and he says the doers of the law shall be justified. So they were declared righteous by doing the works of the law. Romans 2.13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So now in the church age, we can't get justified by the law but people in the old testament got righteousness from the law that is why romans 321 says but now the righteousness of god without the law is manifested the righteousness of god without the law is manifested notice the words but now and if people weren't righteous by keeping the law at one point then why do you see this clear transition in books like galatians where paul is he keeps having to clarify a difference between faith and works to people. Romans 3.20 and 3.21 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. If a righteous man under the Mosaic Covenant turned from his righteousness, then he would die in his sin. Ezekiel 18.24 But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity. Notice what that said. When the righteous, a saved, a saved man, 
turneth away from his righteousness, his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness, righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned, in his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. That is a huge difference from salvation in the church age. Many will claim that that verse I just read, Ezekiel 18.24, is only referring to the righteous man physically dying because he got off into sin. But notice it says, In his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. If a man dies in his sin, then he goes to hell. If you die in your sin, then you're lost and on your way to hell. John 8.24 says, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So what did the verses say? Ezekiel 18.24 says, A righteous man will die in his sin if he turns away from his righteousness. Well, John 8.24 shows us that only lost people die in their sins. If a man dies in his sins, he's going to hell. So you can't say that Ezekiel 18.24 is only referring to the man's physical life. There was a righteousness of the law, as it says in Romans 2.26. This personal, personal righteousness of the man under the law was what got him into Abraham's bosom, where he would be placed until Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In the New Testament, we don't have personal righteousness. We have the righteousness of God. So... There was works involved under the Mosaic Covenant. They had to keep the commandments, and if they broke one, they offered the right sacrifice. And this is what they had to do to make it to Abraham's bosom. This is another way you know they weren't saved just like us. They didn't even go to the same place when they died. They were saved by faith plus works, and when they died, they went to Abraham's bosom in the heart of the earth. And when Jesus resurrected, he took them with him. They were then allowed to go to heaven because the, the ultimate sacrifice had shed his blood. It was God's grace and mercy that allowed them to even be able to do this. He could have just put them in hell. Further proof works were involved was when Jesus told the rich young ruler to keep the commandments to inherit eternal life in Matthew 19, 16 through 21. In Ezekiel 18, the same chapter, in Ezekiel we were talking about earlier, it talks about the wicked oppressing the poor and needy. And this is what put the rich man in hell in Luke 16. So an Old Testament saint had to do works along with faith. The works evidenced his faith, but if he quit doing the works, he would die in his sins. Under the Davidic covenant, the law was still under operation, but there were still differences. 2 Samuel 7.12 says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. David's seed was supposed to establish his kingdom. In 2 Samuel 7, 14-15, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So unlike all the people before, under the Mosaic Covenant, under, under the Davidic Covenant, eternal security was given. It applied directly to David's seed. This eternal security is also given in the church age. The throne of David is said to continue forever. In Luke 1, 32-33, And Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David in the millennium, as it says in Acts 2, 29-30. Jesus didn't sit on the throne when he came the first time because he got a, got a crown of thorns instead of a king's crown. Jesus said when he was here the first time, But now is my kingdom not from hence, as it says in John 18, 36. Under the Davidic covenant, David had the sure mercies of David. David murdered Uriah and committed adultery with his wife, Bathsheba. David should have been put to death according to the law and would have been if it wasn't for these sure mercies of David. 2 Samuel 12, 13 says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. But David understood that he could have lost his salvation and lost the Holy Spirit, unlike today where we are sealed unto the day of redemption. David had said in Psalms 51.11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. If he had the same type of salvation we had, 
then why was he worried about losing his salvation and losing the Holy Spirit? How God dealt with people after the law is different. In Luke 16:16, 16, 16, it says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Luke 3, 7 through 14 shows what people had to do to get righteousness from God in the time of John the Baptist. John was obviously preaching a works-based salvation. He calls them a generation of vipers and names specific sins for each group of people to stop doing. I don't see any other way to look at it. So John preached this works before the cross while Peter preached something similar after the cross. In Acts 2, 37 and 38, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, Unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Many will use these verses to teach you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. But they are applying it to the wrong group. This verse doesn't apply to people in the church age. It is all Jews in Acts chapter 2, and Peter is telling them what to do since they rejected Jesus Christ. They have to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to receive the Holy Ghost. That is different from our salvation in that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost the moment we put our trust on Him. The book of Acts is a transition book, and that is why here you have people receiving the Holy Ghost by baptism, and then later on in Acts 8 they were receiving the Holy Ghost by laying on of hands. Then in Acts 10.43 the Holy Ghost fell down on Cornelius after he believed. This is where charismatics get all messed up. They fail to rightly divide the word of truth. You shouldn't take verses from Acts and override the clear doctrines in the Pauline epistles that are written for us now, which clearly say we get the Holy Ghost the moment we believe. But now we're going to look at how God deals with people in the church age. And we won't get into this one as deep because since we are in that age, you if you're a Christian, you pretty much know how you're saved, right? People in the church age are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood to save them. When you do this, you are born again. In John chapter 3, He introduced the doctrine of the new birth to Nicodemus. Jesus did. And Jesus Christ was the first person born of God. People in the Old Testament were not born again. They weren't spiritually circumcised with their soul cut loose from their flesh. They didn't have redemption. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ purchased you with His own blood. They didn't have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit that seals us into the day of redemption. And they didn't go to the third heaven when they died in the Old Testament. There are so many benefits that we have in the church age that we shouldn't take it for granted. The gospel for the church age is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And Paul tells us the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Every time a person says someone in the church age can lose their salvation, they are taking a verse that should be applied to a different time period and trying to place it on someone in the church age. This is what the Church of God, Pentecostals, Church of Christ, and Holiness groups will do. They fail to rightly divide, whereas most Baptists will do the opposite and try to make the whole Bible teach you eternal security by misapplying the, ver the verses for us today and putting them on people in the Old Testament and people in the Tribulation. We have to do what 2 Timothy 2.15 says and rightly divide the word of truth. Now we're going to look at how God deals with people in the time of Jacob's trouble or tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble starts sometime after the rapture of the body of Christ. The verses directed towards people in the tribulation are most of the time wrongly applied to people in the church age by people who think that we can lose salvation. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they have to endure until the end, the end of that time period, that is... If they don't die as a martyr first, Matthew 24, 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is different from church age salvation because once we are in Christ, we are kept saved by the power of God. No enduring is involved. You see the same idea in Hebrews 3, 6, But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the same, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope from unto the end. And then again in Hebrews 3, 14, you see someone is having to hold on to something until until the end. Hebrews 3.14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Many people who claim we can lose salvation will take you to Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, which says, For it is impossible. Notice that word impossible. 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So people will take these verses and say a man can presently lose his salvation in this age that we're in now. But they're taking this verse and applying it to us when it should be applied to people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Someone in the time of Jacob's trouble can lose their salvation by taking the mark of the beast. And that is the only unpardonable sin. And when they tell you that you can lose your salvation, you should ask them have they ever lost theirs. And if they say yes, we'll say, well that verse says it is impossible for you to be renewed again to repentance. Because look at the verse, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And then in verse 6 it says, If they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance. That's what is impossible, is to renew them again into repentance. And the reason that it's impossible is because they've took that mark. Once they take that mark, they can't go back. And uh, just tell them that if they can lose their salvation, that it is impossible for them to get it back, because that is what the verse says. Someone can lose salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble by taking the mark of the beast. The falling away has to refer to that mark. And that will be an unpardonable sin and a tribulation. And Hebrews 10, 38 and 39 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Righteousness is dispensed in the tribulation time period by faith plus works. And you can see that in Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. People in the church age are trying to deceive people into thinking they can lose salvation. While in the tribulation, the devil will probably tell people they are saved by grace through faith without works, like we are in the church age. So that they will go ahead and take the mark of the beast. The devil hates rightly dividing. So people in the time of Jacob's trouble are saved by faithless works. How could anyone deny this when they know people in the tribulation have to abstain from taking the mark of the beast? Abstaining from doing something is a work. They have to come up with things like saying a true believer wouldn't take the mark. But Christians are worldly now. Think about people in the tribulation and how worldly they're going to be. I mean, they're going to give in to the world just as easy as we do now, if not worse. And now we're going to see how God deals with people in the millennium. In Matthew 5, 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And Matthew 5, 8 is written to a time period called the millennium. The devil can see God right now, and he isn't pure in heart. In the millennium, the devil will be chained a thousand years, and this is where the pure in heart will see God. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. People will see Jesus Christ running on the throne of the millennium and see tons of people with glorified bodies. So where would faith come into play in the millennium? People in the millennium are saved by purely works. They won't be living by faith. They will be living by sight. They won't be looking back at the cross any more than an Old Testament saint looks forward to the cross. But I hope this study has helped you to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. I have not even touched all that there is to this. You're going to have to study the rest for yourself. The Bible comes alive and makes perfect sense if you will put verses in the right context and apply them to who they should be applied to. Don't take verses that are applied to one group and apply them to the other because this makes the Bible contradict and there aren't any contradictions in the Bible.